Hi, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 100. And this episode is actually with me. So let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. All right, so I can't believe that we are at episode 100. I started this podcast about two years ago, and I only intended to make about five episodes and just see how it went. And now here we are, there's tens of thousands of downloads every month, slowly getting up to about 100,000 downloads per month. And it's been a lot of work, a lot of time, but the emails I get from people reaching out with their success stories and about their career paths, their lives being changed. That's been what's made me put in all the hard work and keep this going. And these days, I owe a lot to my team who's added so much value to this podcast. And I've got so much more planned. We're just getting started. But as of right now, the podcast is in the top 200 career podcasts on iTunes out of something like 100 million podcasts. So I want to say thank you for all of your help. And if you do enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to go into your Google Calendar and just quickly schedule five minutes today sometime or right now to go into iTunes and leave a review or simply rate the podcast. That would mean the world to me. And I'd like to show my gratitude for everyone who already has. Uh, there will be a link in the show notes if you want to go to alanmckay.com slash 100. So last week in episode 99, I interviewed my fiance, Christina Burden, who talks a lot about her struggles and successes building her career as an artist in her late 20s. And next episode, I'm interviewing Ben Snow, who was the 30th employee at ILM and is still a visual effects supervisor for Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, I have to admit, I was a huge fan of his growing up in my teens, watching the makings of The Mummy and all these other movies. And he's been involved in everything from Twister, Mars Attacks, Jurassic Park 2, Deep Impact, Pearl Harbor, Star Wars 2, King Kong, Iron Man, Pirates of the Caribbean, and many, many others. He just finished up working on Mother, the director Darren Aronofsky's new film. And we have loads of amazing episodes coming up, as well as a lot of solo episodes and talks that I've got planned as well. So I'm going to be contributing a lot, especially as we get closer to the end of the year. There's a lot of really great content that I want to inject into this podcast. But I did want to do something different for episode 100. And I was having dinner with Fred Ruff, the founder of Refuge VFX, who is responsible for a lot of really big TV show visual effects like Grimm and stuff like that. Also, he was in episode 36 talking about his TV show pilot for Animal Planet on the Discovery Channel. And Fred mentioned he wanted to interview me on the podcast sometime. And that made me think it might make for a great 100th episode. So we did this episode at my house with a couple of bottles of wine and the rest is history. So enjoy. Okay, just quickly, one of the biggest problems that we face as artists is figuring out how much we're worth. Typically, the situation is that we go into job interviews and we're asked how much we're going to charge. We either shoot ourselves in the foot by saying that we charge less than we're worth, so that way we get the gig, and indirectly end up leaving tens of thousands of dollars accumulatively over time on the table, rather than actually asking what we should be charging. At the same time, you don't want to alienate your employers by asking for too much and leaving yourself out in the cold. So what I've done is I put together a website, check it out, www.vfxrates.com. And this is a chance for you to be able to put in your experience, your discipline, the location you're working, all the good things that will give you a fairly accurate idea of what you and everyone else should be charging in your discipline. This is something that I'm going to continue to build and flesh out over time. But the key thing is actually that I don't want to just showcase how much you should be worth, but also show you and hand you the tools to grow beyond that and to learn to negotiate better, to learn to ask for the, the right amount of money in the right way. There's lots of additional tools and information I want to hand over to you. Everything's free. Check it out, vfxrates.com. Put in your information and you'll instantly get notified of how much money you should be charging per hour as a VFX artist. vfxrates.com. 
What do you got? All right. Well, why don't we why don't we start by introducing yourself, and then I'll introduce myself. You you son wanna, of a bitch. You want to sure. do it the other way around? Uh, I'm Alan McKay. I am a VFX supervisor, and I also have a podcast. And this is it. So that we're on yeah. right now. <laughs> awesome. I live in Portland, and I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'm Fred Ruff. And I have a company called Refuge uh, mm-hmm. here in Portland. You've been on the podcast before. I have been on the podcast before. Um, I'm kind of we've kind of met through the Autodesk community. Speaking of, well, we've Autodesk. known. I mean, I've known of you forever. And the thing is, we never actually met ever. And then I think we were both doing like a media interview for Autodesk in Vegas in a hotel. That's right. Somewhere, which we, they never aired those interviews. I don't know what they did with that footage, but I felt like I nailed show. that interview. And like, I did too. I was like, yeah, I totally killed that thing. I thought my hair was good that day or something and never saw the light of day. So that was a bummer. But yeah, I think I, I vaguely, I think we walked past each other and was just like, hey, I'm Alan, I'm Fred. And that was it. And then we did the podcast a year later, I guess. And um, I'll have to link to that. But it was the Animal Planet one. Yeah. And um, yeah, then finally we get up here and we went to, what was that bar? Uh, it starts with W, I think. Uh, uh, Watson Hall. Watson Hall. Uh, yeah. There's a little plug for the uh, <laughs> bar in Portland here. Yeah. Um, so this is your 100th podcast. Yeah. Special. I haven't really had a, get a chance to think about it yet. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's just a number, but it's a nice round, even number. So mm-hmm. Getting a triple digit. Give you something to look All at. Right. Speaking of which, um, have you learned a lot in these 100 podcasts? Like, do you think that, like, the whole format has changed for you and, like, what you first started doing and what you do now? It's, it's kind of interesting because I've, this is going to make me sound, like, really big-headed, but, like, I've listened to so many people's podcasts and episode one through to 50 usually like a lot of people it, it takes them a while to kind of get their grasp and um yeah i, I you know i listen to mine like yeah it's definitely i remember like episode one i still think episode one is awesome uh i, I listened to it once i was walking back from like century city one day i just decided to walk home it was like a two-hour walk and who'd you interview in episode one yeah i did a solo episode but it was basically a brain dump of just like a lot to do with everything i thought i wanted to get off my chest about being a successful freelancer yeah. and um yeah, I never listen to my own podcast. I think it's kind of creepy, but I did that day and I was like, fuck, I, I need to listen to this myself more because there there was a lot of good stuff in there. And besides like hitting the space bar or what, like pause and resume, like little, <laughs> little screw ups like that, um, the format hasn't changed much. I think it's going to pretty soon. Uh, I feel like it's time to kind of go with version 2.0. But um, yeah, at the same time, like, you know, I, I feel pretty blessed to have gone through this. I just interviewed... Um, Ben Snow from ILM the other day, and I probably won't ever acknowledge it outside of this, which here we go, there's 100,000 people now heard it. Um, but, uh, you know, I was like a total fanboy of his growing up, yeah. and um, in a way, it was like really awesome. In fact, it's going to be episode 101 will be his. So, um, yeah, it was like, it was really great for me to, to treat it as a way to kind of get access to people and talk to them. I did meet him before in an elevator, but I never worked directly with him. And you come from like, I mean, it sounds like the first podcast, it, w- it came from a point of like, Hey, I want to, I want to pass on this knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, so it sounds like that's where this originally came from. That first podcast was you trying to dump out all this information on other people to share that, you know? Mm-hmm. And it seems like, well, even today before the, before we started talking, you said, Hey, I do want to talk about things that can help other people. That's Cause yeah, I have no idea goal. what you're going to talk about, but yeah, we're still <laughs> about projects. So I'm like, yeah, I can talk about my resume or we can, you know, hopefully make it something that people can take away. And I will say like, I'll try and keep this short, but for me, um, my biggest gripe is that like, I've been very goal driven from day one when I was 14, you know, I was in Australia and I had my heart set on, I want to work in Hollywood, a visual effects supervisor. Well, that brings me to my first question, actually. Mm-hmm. So let's, let's just, I'm just going to give you the formal way of saying, um, you know, did you, did you always know you wanted to be in this industry or was it a little vague at some point until you figured out, well, that specific part, like, did you grow up and say, I want to make movies or were you saying, no, I want to do specifically visual effects. You know, was there any other part of the industry that you were first interested mm-hmm. in before you got into business? That's effects? literally always the first question I ask people. Um, so... No, I mean, I, I always loved art. I didn't really think of it as a career. I, I, I dabbled with everything, but it was always creative stuff. So, like, I wanted to be a writer. I think it's because one of my uncles wanted to be a writer, but because I did a lot of writing. And, you know, this is me at, like, eight years old. Um, but, yeah, I always wanted to be an artist. I designed all these He-Man toys when I was a kid, and I, I thought my mom had sent them to Mattel. It wasn't until I was about, like, 15 or 18 that I asked her, like, you know, did you send those off? And she's like, oh, no, I never did that. And I was like, well, how I, did you design it? Like just on paper? Yeah, I was just coming up with him. But I think about that. You think of the movie Big, you know, like he's the ideal, you know, candidate to design toys because 
um, Tom Hanks is a kid, you know, so he's the target market. So yeah. for me, it was just like, I was just coming up with ideas because I love creating, but I think video games was definitely um, one that I delved into for a while. And, you know, I wanted to do something like that. Um, film to me, I didn't, you know, I was still wrapping my hand around. I, I love 3D uh, as much as art. So yeah, I mean, that was definitely somewhere to do with the creative world. And like, that's the thing, visual effects, like when I got into it, no one else knew what it was, you know, and I, you, you would have been the same way. Like no one knew what 3D animation was. The, the term visual Park. effects is more recent. I mean, yeah. even back in those days, it wasn't a, there wasn't a term for it. It yeah. was a little vague. It was special effects, essentially. Right? Yeah. And um, even the other day, 3D I animation. It was, it was, yeah. it was, it was, I would have to always point to Jurassic Park. And yeah. Like that Toy Story came out. And finally, you could be like, okay, yeah, that kind of shit. So what was the first like piece of software you picked up? You know, you talk about being eight years old, being 14. Uh, when was that point where you picked up a piece of software and started playing? I was using a bunch of like free mouse apps that you could draw pixel by pixel. Uh, you know, like really terrible ones uh, that come free with like the mouse to demonstrate that you can. So, but uh, <laughs> then I got Deluxe Paint and Deluxe Paint Animation, which were for the Amiga, but I had them on PC. D-Paint, otherwise known as, right? Uh, D-Paint, yeah. I and, remember I went to a, a studio when I was first starting my career and they were like, do you know D-Paint? I yeah. had never even heard of such a it's thing. It's kind of like Animator Pro, but way, yeah, way better. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I thought it was funny how like I went through that that game studio, and, and apparently in games, it was it was huge by that point. So everybody knew DP. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what it was. It was awesome. I and never learned it. I, I started with that, and that was when I first got serious, and I started getting... I got sold a 286 secondhand, and my uncle got his like father-in-law to sell me his crappy 286. It was meant to be a 386, and I was in denial, even though it says 286 on the, the CMOS screen, the buy screen. And it wasn't until finally I tried to install Doom and it's like, you need a 386SX or higher to, to run it. And I'm like, if Doom <laughs> says it, then I believe it now. I have a piece of shit. So that's early. You And, and you're a mm -hmm. bit younger than me. So that was, that was pretty, that was. Yeah, that was I would have been 10 or 11, I think. And like, that was the thing is I never, like, I will say I never had money. I, I was paying rent when I was 14 with my mom. Like we split it 50-50. And so that was always the thing. Like I never, I, I heard a quote the other day, Christina told me about Paris Hilton when she said, she never knew she was rich until she went to her friend's places. And I thought about that. I'm like, I didn't realize I was poor until I went to all my friend's places. And I'm like, wow, like we have nothing. But it meant that the first computer I ever got, the crappy 286, I paid for out of my own pockets selling my own artwork. Do you remember how much it was? Uh, it was like 500 bucks. It was second hand. Oh, okay. It was yeah, old. that's cheap. So 486s were out at that point. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the interesting thing was that I, I got that and I couldn't run Doom, but I was obsessed with Doom. Uh, it was like my thing. So um I ended up taking all the artwork and putting it into Wolfenstein. And like, that's kind of where, you know, it kind of got me going. I was just, I was obsessed with customizing and creating my own stuff. Um, and then I picked up a, uh, eventually got a 3D, 3D construction set was one that I bought at a store for like 50 bucks. It came with a VHS uh, cassette, which showed you how to use it. And it was pretty much like typing and all the shit. And I was terrible at it. I didn't really get it. But finally, my mom randomly one day bought me an issue of Design Graphics Magazine, which is an Australian kind of like Photoshop retouching magazine. Right. And it had a review of 3D Studio DOS 3 in there. And um, it also was showing a lot of like Alias Wavefront ads. And that was the point where I was good at drawing and doing 2D art, but I could never draw these shiny, what we look at now is terrible, but at the time like shiny reflective surfaces and all this kind of stuff. So, so you got excited about that. You saw that yeah. and you were like, ooh. Yeah, I'm like, I want to do that because I could never paint that. So like Poveray, a few things like that kind of came into play. But yeah, yeah 3D Studio... DOS was where, I, like years later, is where I finally was like, this is it for me. And yeah, never looked back. Cool, cool. That's a good start. Um, I was going to ask you what you did before you got into 3D and stuff, but it sounds like at 10 years old, there wasn't much of a previous notion of what you might do. What I will say is that like, I had a weird career where I, I basically started working when I was 14. And I ended up quitting school grade nine, second week of grade nine, but I barely went from grade five on. What was the job that you were doing? That you I got like web pages. I was designing um, the first ever operating system for HDTV. Now we look at that, that would basically be your Fire TV or your I, uh, Apple TV, all that kind of stuff. Like I was designing that back in 97, 96. We were designing one because that was a new thing coming around the corner. So we're designing. It's really funny because it's exactly how it is like now. It's like, fuck, that was, a... so that was like one gig I did. Um, first real gig I got was on. Damn it, that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, 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 because no, it's like in tears. Okay, for me, and that was the interesting thing is like I got this really big gig. I worked for Valve Software on Team Fortress 2 and Half-Life. And that was huge. And I felt like after doing a AAA game, I've made it. I'm going to, 
I'm going to be good. And I ended up having like a year and a half of like crickets, you know, and, <laughs> and was that your first big project then? Yeah. Was... So I'd done like a, a few random things, like a web page, or I'd be on IRC and someone's like, I need something modeled. I'm like, I'll go model that. But then I got like a gig. I finally cut a reel. I felt like, okay, I'm old enough. I'm going to cut a reel. And uh, I applied at two places, Team Fortress Software in Melbourne. They got acquired by Valve like minutes later. And then Ritual, which were in Dallas, Texas, I think. And um, both offered me jobs, but I was only 15. I think either of them knew that. So I felt like working in Australia remotely was a better choice. Um, the, only, the only reason I'm going to go into this way for a second was um, all my friends, they had the standard life of going to school, getting a part-time shitty job at McDonald's or Domino's Pizza, Pizza Hut, whatever. And I got jealous of that because I had been working in an office and making good money and here are my friends like doing these part-time gigs and I ended up quitting it all for about a year and going working at KFC just because I wanted to have... This a, was after... Yeah, uh, I'd been working for about two years and then it's probably when I was 16, I decided to quit, not quit 3D, but I just wanted to go and live the normal life my friends had, like a shitty job and I enrolled at school. <laughs> you you yeah. aspired to a shitty job yeah, so that you can get some life experience maybe. It was awesome though. I had a great time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was really fun, but I kind of, it's just funny that I, I did segue from that. And then after a while, I got bored of it. And then I, you know. What was the type of work you were doing for, for Val? This was rem remotely, mm -hmm. you said? Yeah. What kind, what kind of things were you Modeling, doing? Modeling, animation, texturing, the same kind of shit. Like back then, you would do it all. And so world building and some maybe some characters. And yeah, I didn't like do any maps for them. But, um, but yeah, I, I feel like for especially a smaller city, country, all that kind of stuff, smaller industry, you got to be a generalist. And I think like Ben Snow and I actually talked about it the other day starting out as a generalist and I, I so fucking agree in that yeah no i do too i think i think uh, i see a lot of kids coming out of school and they specifically want to get into one thing and i'm like well that's not there's not a lot of opportunities in that yet mm -hmm. for you yeah you really want to be able to try everything i mean that's kind of the way you should come approach life is like yep. see try a bunch of different things and see what you're KFC, good at see movies games <laughs> yeah so you were in games for a little bit KFC was involved. Um, so what happened next? I mean, where did that go? You must have got itchy to get back into what you loved again. And mm -hmm. was it back into games? Or I should say, like, when was your first? When did your first hit film? So thinking about this, I'm trying to figure out the timeline. So basically, there was a uh, studio in Sydney called Ambience, and I feel like just like digital domains, like 3.0, I think they're up to now. Ambience has gone through iterations where it was one of the top two studios in the world. Now I think if anyone hears of Ambience, they're going to think like that place is a sweatshop and a pile of crap and it's definitely gone downhill. But when I was um, originally approached, it was like a huge deal and they wanted me to move to Sydney and I was only 16, I think at the time. And um, so I ended up talking to James Whitlam, who was the head of 3D there. And he'd been trying to hire me for quite a number of years and I just wasn't ready to move. And then coincidentally, um, I got offered a job at Infograms, which was originally Beam Software as the first game studio in Australia. And, um, yeah, that was in Melbourne and I knew someone in Melbourne. So I ended up like just taking a job down there when I quit KFC. Um, so, you know, when I decided to quit KFC, I just, at that point I'd build enough of a, a reel and portfolio that I could get work. And so I applied there I moved to Melbourne and I'll, I'll talk about that for a moment because it was interesting. It was the only time in my life I've ever been fired. And this was okay. Yeah. I was 17 at the time. So I'm, I mean, turning down ambience, which is where I wanted to be. I, at that point I was doing a lot of map painting. I was doing effects i was integrating a lot of live action and cg and that's what james had said to me is just like you you're able to demonstrate like what usually takes about two or three years for people to get to that level of understanding like you get it right away like you know how to integrate live action cg and finish shots and i thought that was really critical and um so meanwhile i ended up taking this job in a game studio and i didn't want to work in games at that point but it was just it was easy for me to go there because i knew someone there i could crash on the couch for a few weeks and so I ended up taking a job that I didn't want. My heart wasn't in it. And I made the number one big mistake that I think everyone should avoid when they move to a new city. And that is that I ended up just, I didn't get settled right away. And that all the trying to find a house and trying to get settled and dealing with all that BS, that would then trickle into my work as well because I um, couldn't find a home. And right. meanwhile, like I had those people and I had never lived on my own or been away from my home really. So suddenly I had like the people I was living with who didn't really know me that well. They you know, knew me online or whatever. And so they're, they're eventually like, look, you've stayed a few weeks. One of our roommates who doesn't know you doesn't want you here because he likes to watch TV all night and you're on the couch. So you got to get out. And so suddenly I'm dealing with all this kind of shit. And that was affecting my work where I'm having to leave early. 
Um, I'm stressed about that. I'm trying to like check out houses at lunchtime, coming back an hour late. And yeah, basically I was there for only like three weeks, but I only had a little bit of money. And the same day I got let go, I was good kicked out of the home. So I had no money, no place to stay, um, no job and anything. And I was just like completely fucked. So you just go back home? Well, I couldn't get home. Like I was on the other side of Australia <laughs> and I'd never been away from home before. And yeah, I ended up basically being homeless for a couple of days, just trying to like figure it out. Cause I had a return ticket for Christmas and I ended up negotiating with the, the airline to let me trade that in for a ticket. You know, and wow. these days it wouldn't be a big deal, but for me at the time, never having experienced that before, yeah, it fucked me. Like, uh, it totally fucked me up afterwards. But like, at you know, at the time, like I, I didn't know how to deal with it or or resolve the issue. And um, this is why credit cards, I guess, is you know always a lifesaver. But uh, I didn't have any of that shit. So eventually, go home, um, and then I ended up lecturing at university uh, right after that. I got a job out there, and but the interesting thing was it, it did like mentally fuck me up for probably six months. Just I think like I've talked about this before, but I think that um, there's a few core things that all of us need to have taken care of, which would be relationships, home, you know, money, job. And those are the foundations that we live on. If, if one of those is rocked, it really hits home for you. And for me, not having a home or a job or any of those things. like Those are big. Yeah. So I'd have nightmares all the time of like being stranded on an island or being stranded in another city or whatever metaphorical things that really were dealing with that. And um, so I, I think that in a lot of ways that taught me that I will never ever let that happen again. And I'll make sure to get my shit on top. I'll make sure I've always got options. Cause like the good thing was when I left that job, I literally hadn't even left the premises and I called up James Whitlam in Sydney and I'm like, yes, yeah, this gig in Melbourne isn't working out. How about I come to, to Sydney? And um, he's like, come on down. And I ended up waiting a year more before I eventually pulled the trigger. But when I did, that was the, best experience of my life and changed everything was that still in games then you were still no like that was the thing that one gig in melbourne was games i didn't even want to do games like as soon as everyone left the night yeah. i would pull out the wacom and i was just doing matte painting and i was because I, I loved you know back then i needed if i destroyed a building i needed to paint out you know do the destruction so it always be in the matte painting as well as all the effects so my heart was in that and i knew that i knew that i didn't want to be there in the first place and yeah um so i was doing it in my spare time and yeah, so after that, it was it was basically commercials moving forward. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I didn't know any of that. That's interesting. I don't really talk about this shit too often. Yeah, I mean, who talks about... <laughs> you got to wait 100 episodes to, somewhere. to talk about getting fired. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of, you know, I obviously... I asked... Well, I actually wanted to ask what was your first big project. You said it was, you know, early on in the games industry. Right. But after that point, there must have been another mm-hmm. project where you did some stuff and you were like, holy shit, this yep. is the one. I, I've, I've really hit it big. So I think that um, there's never just like one. I think there's always those like key moments that are for someone uh, that are, um, you know, really critical to your career. And so for me, like the first gig was interesting, but it didn't really, you know, like I said, I had a drought after that where I didn't get any work for a while. And then interestingly, I went on and lectured at university, hated that, but it was weird being 17 years old, lecturing at high school, sorry, at a university level, diploma level. Sorry, that's Amazon Echo in the background. Did you enjoy, like, the, you said I, did, you, I enjoyed it. Like, sure. teaching, like, mm-hmm. lecturing and kind of, because it seems that you're a little bit in that now. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, a, a bit of what you do. I was watching a, you know, a live stream the other day and you, mm-hmm. you're you basically giving an, a, an on, online teaching, you know, a right. free session. So you must have had something that you liked about teaching at the university. My, my philosophy was always that, like, no one ever shared their secrets and always bothered me, especially back in the 90s. Like, everyone had their one oh, little yeah. trick. So I made it my thing. I would I would dedicate more time to helping others. And that's the thing, the college I was at, um, there's this one thing that one of the owners of the studio, I gather actually a massive college in Australia, but like I remember one of the founders saying one day when I, I told them like the curriculum we're teaching is shit, you know, um, no one is learning anything. And I remember him saying that they, they want to keep it simple. It's easier on them and it's easier on us. And that made me so fucking angry that like people are spending twenty, thirty thousand dollars to come and learn, and you're basically being taught like how to fucking extrude a cube into a right, box. Right, because it's easier for the teachers. Yeah, to and teach it. It's bullshit. It made me so angry. So I ended up like talking them, and I was only seventeen, but talking them into letting me instead of teach their curriculum to focus entirely on beginner classes and advanced classes. So everyone who's struggling in the class, I would devote time to getting them to not be struggling. Then there's people who wanted more. And those are all the people who are already at industry level. Like you go into the industry and work in games. Uh, I ended up 
um, teaching them all the advanced stuff, the stuff that they really should be learning or want to be learning. And some of those guys went off to be amazing. My roommate ended up founding Half Brick, which is this company that created Fruit Ninja. Yeah. So, um, and now they're worth like ridiculous amounts of money. And so a lot of my old students all went off and, and did that, which was kind of cool. Because um, I, as a parting gift, when I finally did bite the bullet and move to Sydney and take the job at Ambience, which is the job that, um, there's going to be a lot of segueing here. Um, but, you know, as a parting gift, I basically decided to model them a, a logo for their company. And yeah, I built them like this shitty half brick thing. And years later, I was playing uh, with a friend's daughter on Thanksgiving. She was like four years old on the iPad and playing Fruit Ninja with her. And I remember looking at about, I was just bored. And I looked at it and I'm like, why do I recognize that logo? And I realized that it was a permutation of the one I had built like a hundred years ago. And I'm like, oh, holy funny. shit. Yeah. So to get to the point though, with, um, with the job though, like when I moved to Sydney, you know, I've been doing 3D for four years, five years at that point. I had been working on stuff, but it was always remote. And that's when things changed where I I sat down next to a guy named Scott Tansley. And I, I told him this a few years ago, like the first two weeks of sitting with him, I learned, I, I relearned 3D. Just being around pros, people who are in the industry, uh, I felt like in two weeks, I had learned more than I'd learned in five years by myself. Yeah, because you were, you were trying to learn it on your own, yeah. trying out things. And here you are sitting with somebody who has experience. What do you learn when you're at a facility versus what do you learn when you're off doing freelance? And you've had both those experiences. You're working remotely in your early days. And obviously, I don't want to talk about what you learned there because that's, that's, that's hard. Um, now you go to a facility for the first time. Mm -hmm. You're around people. You're, your people skills, now they're all being tested um, how you collaborate is being, everything's being tested. So tell mm -hmm. me about what you learn when you first go to a facility, because young artists, they're going to have these opportunities. They're going to go somewhere. And I want us to talk about for a little bit, uh, about what they need to think about when they mm -hmm. go to a facility, because they could easily be out in three weeks and on the street yeah. without a home if they don't fucking handle that yeah. right. So talk a little bit about what you think you really learn at a facility for the first time. Well, I will say like from the, cause you got the, I'm going to steal what, the guys that did software have kind of taught me, which was like hard skills and soft skills. And like, you know, on the hard skills in terms of like what you're doing, techniques and everything, I think that the greater thing is that you're actually being put in situations that you typically wouldn't do. You're probably going to never challenge yourself and push yourself. You're going to give up a lot sooner, but when you're given responsibilities, you're accountable for it. So I think like for me, like the first job I ever did at that studio was I did a talking dog commercial. So I'm animating a fucking dog talking and doing you know all that to a real dog compositing and getting it all working and i'd never done anything like that before and then the next thing was a print commercial of a fire hydrant i had the model and you know and once in a while i might actually get to do effects which is what i you know if i had in my way i'd be doing it all the time so in a way you kind of put in these situations where you're challenged and you're going to be like okay great how the fuck am i going to do this rather than what do i want to do at home spaceships and blowing up planets and all that boring <laughs> right. shit so i think that's really critical but uh, you're right. Like I, I went through so many, like I had so many epiphanies in the first few years of, of working that changed how I, I work forever. And I think initially one of the big mistakes I made was that there was one jokester at the studio that I thought everyone loved. And I think in a lot of ways I started to kind of model myself after him as in like, Oh, he's a prankster. He does all this stuff. And it wasn't until years later, I realized that like he was, he eventually did get fired, but like he was always on the brink of getting fired. And, you know, I would have probably been way more responsible after my previous experience. It's just after kind of seeing that everyone likes this guy, I'll be the funny guy too. Um, that I, I know for a fact that that cost me never really kind of getting pay rise, not getting as many pay rises and things like that. Um, just because, you know, as James Whitland put it to one of my friends, when he asked him like, why the hell are you paying Alan like peanuts when he's doing like, you know, a lot of work. Uh, it was just because like, you know, Alan's acting immature and I was 18, but the thing is, <laughs> again, having in your defense, it's like, I was 18 years old. What do you expect? <laughs> but, but, um, having the previous ex ex experience of, um, getting fired, like I was, you know, I was being immature when I was 17 and dicking around at the other studios. So, uh, I was going in fully professional. I was professional at the place I was lecturing at, but again, just sometimes mimicking people around you that you think are cool or, or, or whatever. It's not, you know, I think it's better just to be humble, be quiet, shut the fuck up. Cause I see it all the time. People in their first few weeks, they come in, they think they're hot shit and you, you're just better off listening, you know? And I think one of the big things though, was that, you know, I, I would do work and like, let's say if uh, I would hide my work from the producers cause I, my, in my head, it's like, 
if they don't see it, they can't give me feedback. And in Australia, producers would be the ones uh, directing the projects. Don't ask me why. Um, so, you know, there's just like stupid shit like that. Whereas... I think eventually so you, I, you wanted to avoid feedback. Yeah. Like, yeah. Cause, cause then they can't change it. And, and you know, it makes sense at the time. It's hard. hard. It's a lot of work. It's, yeah. And Scott, Scott Tansley taught me something that I repeat to everyone all the time, which is as long as they have the money, I have the time. And that stuck with me my entire life. Yeah. And, I once said to a, a, an employee, I said, as long as I keep paying you, you shouldn't have any issues yeah. with any changes. Cause if we're done, I'm done with you. Yeah. No, <laughs> so, you know, the project's over. We, we're going to have to. Did you notice he, he or she started working really slow? After <laughs> <laughs> I have had that situation before where someone was kind of like, I'm just trying to make sure I got enough work. And I was like, dude, don't do that. It's actually going to be more detrimental to your career than ever if you milk a, an opportunity. Because you do, you know, especially in the business we're in now where you bring somebody in for one thing, whether it's like, hey, I want you to do a water sim. We got this whole project. There's 20 guys working on it. You're just going to do this one sim. If you try to milk that, as long as you can, um, the producer might secretly be frustrated with you and just never call you again. So mm -hmm. I think that's one of the lessons is like, no, do your work great. Do it as fast as you can do it. Mm -hmm. Do it great. If you want more, one more revision, ask for it. Do it. But don't don't dog it because that's going to make you. Right. And that was one of Scott's you. lessons for me. He kept telling me to slow down because I was trying to impress everyone with how fast I was, which is the <laughs> reverse, which, you know, as we we're talking about quality of quantity, um, for me, I kind of wanted to impress everyone by how quick I am because it's what everyone always told me, Alan, you're so quick. So, um, <laughs> not everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Okay. That okay. One we're time? not going to get into that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, one of the big lessons I had, because first of all, working commercials as a generalist, uh, I think it's the best move you can ever make because I always say your first reel is a throwaway reel. So in other words, you don't want your student work or any of the shit that you did before you got in there because the work you do with a team is just polished you know yeah, it's going to bring you to another yeah. level and like after a year or two years i had like 30 something pieces on my reel i was like having to pick you know these ones won't make it on because i got to keep it under three minutes and that first reel i cut ended up like tim miller saw it tried to get me to go to blur for like you know five years and um and that was all from my first year of like my new reel but so i think that's really critical it is to be a generalist and in the working commercials you're going to have so much stuff Rather than like later in my career, I got offered to work on Happy Feet and that would have been three years of fucking snowflakes, you know, and 20 shots, you know. So I think commercials start there. But the big lesson I, I learned was that initially I would do work and the work, the work I did uh, in some areas, like I, I'd always just think like what I want it to look like and I would do that and then have the, the friction of the producer or the client saying, make it more like this. And I'd be like, okay, great. I'll go do that. And especially if people made the mistake of saying, make it 50% that, because then you're like, okay, 50%, you know? And when I finally for once stopped, this is probably like eight months into it. And this is like, I did really well in my career. Everyone was very impressed. I'm, I'm mature enough at this point that I can say that without feeling like, you know, I've got a big head. I'm like, I was good at what I did, but at the same time, there was always this impending time creep where I would get to the 11th hour and I'm like, fuck, where did all my time go? And like this the stress, I'd always be like having to deliver the 11th hour and always be stressed out about work, working crazy hours and yeah, trying to like guess what they want. And I think finally when I, when it all changed for me, it was when I finally started to think what, you know, guessing what the, the director, the supervisor, the client would want instead of saying what I think it's like, well, what are they going to say next? And the you're more, saying that's bad or you're saying no, that's it was smart. good. The more, smart. yeah, the more I started to anticipate what they would say rather than me direct it myself, like, this is going to look cool. I'm going to do this. Start saying, well, no, like I know that they like more yellow. I know that they like more contrast. This is what I'm going to do and start to anticipate what they want. And suddenly they would come back and be like, oh yeah, this is looking great. Just change this little thing yeah. instead of it being this painstaking, what do you want thing? And bit by bit, I started to learn that producers, I, I worked with a lot of to this day, very high, strong, coked up producers. And um, so like now I see a whole different light, but like at the time, I it would just be expected that you'd get these yelling, freaked out producers who were always screaming at everyone. And then when I started to kind of anticipate what they would want, I would start doing variations, like walk them through like, hey, I did this, but I also thought maybe you'd want this. So I had 20 minutes. So I knocked out these other variations. What do you want? And then bit by bit, like I'd be like, wow, like producers don't yell at you anymore. And the more I did this, the more suddenly everything changed within like a year. I was being brought into the flame suite because the director was like, Alan, I want your opinion on this, this, and this. And 
the more I started to align myself with their vision instead of my vision, that changed everything. That yeah. was like probably the the first big aha I had. And like later on, it would be managing uh, myself as if I was a producer. There's a lot of other ones we can get into, but that was, a, I think, a huge epiphany where suddenly I wasn't getting in trouble. I was delivering on time. People recognized like the work I was doing was like drastically changing. Uh, like I said, I'll be brought in just to kick back with the clients and hang out and drink instead of doing my work because suddenly they respected my opinion. You yeah, know? that's and, huge. Yeah, and and I, I wish that more people did that because it took me a while to realize it, but it's it changes everything when you realize we are in the service industry and you're being hired to, I always use the analogy of paint a house or sweep a floor or whatever, you know, and if you get to create, awesome, but you're there for their vision in the long run. Yeah, that's, I think that's, you touch on something that's probably really important to people coming into the industry and um, guys that are new at it, even at facilities or even freelancing that um, if you sit there and try to think of what, if you try to nail what you're trying to do, you're probably, and we always say that, you know, you have, um, 10% of the time to get 90% of the way. And then the other 90% of the time t- takes yeah, 10%. Yeah, 90% is, is like... Right. So if you're trying to do your vision, you're taking a lot of time to polish that last little bit when sometimes pulling out and looking at the project as a whole and thinking, what does my client want? What are they looking mm-hmm. to do? Um, I think seeing shots also in context too is mm-hmm. helpful. Sometimes you get in a shot, you're trying to make everything perfect and then you pull back and you go, I did something which actually no one even is going to notice. And it actually pulls you away from what the story of... The commercial is, which is usually selling some product, you know, mm-hmm. or, or trying to evoke an emotion. Um, yep. Are there other experiences that you've learned over the years that you would give advice on how oh, to man. do that with clients? Like how to, because you don't want a young kid to come in and say, well, I thought this right away, mm-hmm. but you do want them to kind of like those versions. I, I always thought it's important when someone's given a task, they always think that's my task. I'm going to get to the task. But I think sometimes they forget that the task is like, there's a whole bunch of other things you could probably do. Mm-hmm. And I this always is, think this is wine, by the way. We are not in the men's room right now. Just <laughs> FYI, you I always think it's important for them, for for people to kind of think outside the box a little bit about mm-hmm. how do I give my next, whether it's the supervisor, the client, the producer, how do I give them something to to run with? So if you've been tasked with generating an image, like you said, it was like, well, I generate seven, and mm-hmm. I'd show them my process along the way. Um, I always yeah. tell my artists like, if you leave for the day and you're not, and you might not come in tomorrow, you might be sick. I want to be able to get on the server and see what you did the day before. And I shouldn't have to call you to say, you didn't make yeah. an image when you left. Like there's always like a, a way to be that, you know, mm-hmm. to be responsible. I was wondering if there's anything else that might be around that. that so sparks many. Your memory. I mean, we all work in commercials. So we were always joking about, we could write a book. This isn't to do with this, but like we could always write a book on how to trick clients, you know, cause like there'd be stupid shit. Like um, another thing Scott Tansley always said, cause we had Konami as a client and like Konami were notorious for like, they would get you to work. They were one of our best clients. They would get you to work for two months, three months on a project. And then the last week they get there and everything you've done will get thrown out. It'll get simplified. Like Scott would animate, uh, he's a character animator. So he'd animate this tiger creeping and jumping and leaping. And they'd come back and like pick up a car, like a toy car. And they'd be like, hi. And it's like two keyframes. So, <laughs> so Scott would pick it up and be like, hi. It's like, hi. So it's, okay, delete all keyframes except for two. And they'd be like, hi, hi, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's just like, it was one of those things that, um, you know, they were like notorious, for, like you would work 24 hours a day for seven days while they're there. So it's kind of like cruisy. You anticipate that, but like, wow. it would always be that way. But then there'd be other clients that you would, um, sorry, I, I, it's kind of funny because I'm just kind of going down memory lane with all this, but I think it is such interesting, at least to me, stuff. But you would get stupid stuff like the client really respects James Whitlam. So, James, can you come by and just be like, oh my God, I love this. You know, it's just coincidentally, like walk by and do that. And then the client will be like, oh, James, yeah, I love it too. Right. You know, and, respect for him. Yeah. And it's like all these stupid, dumb tricks. So we're always joking about that kind of stuff. And like Scott, again, would always say, um, always save your versions because, uh, you know, you get to like version 95 and then they're like, can you go back to version one? And Konami was notorious for that shit. It's a version one. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and I always say these days, like, um, hard drive space is cheap and man hours aren't. So I can, you can always delete all versions, but like I, I hardly ever overwrite the same file because I don't want to accidentally corrupt. A oh file yeah. Or, that's, that's know. a mantra that yeah. needs to be taught to every student everywhere. It's like never save over the same file. Yep. So in terms of, um, and that's what, uh, toxic and, um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, nucleus were going to be all about. So, oh, right. You know, right. you're, you're yeah. essentially saving to a database. 
anyway, <clears throat> so, you know, what was interesting though, was like, yeah, a couple of key life lessons for me, um, at one point at a different studio later on, but I, I started doing a few things, which would be, I started spending 15 minutes every day at the very end of the day, I'd, I'd finish 15 minutes early and I would just sit and write down what I accomplished that day and also what I need to accomplish the next day. And now that's actually become a big part of my life because you, you use a brain calories, uh, on thinking about what you got to do, Like right? The more you got to think about what you're going to have for breakfast or what you're going to dress as that day, whatever. Um, the more decisions you make, you've only got a finite amount of decisions that you can make in a day. And for me to already know before I come in what I need to have done while I'm still in the trenches. God, while I'm still I love that. Why are my, all my employees doing that? So cause I'm I, a bad boss. I guess. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> but the thing is like, I'll dive more into that in a moment, but like all of these things, it wasn't like I started doing, well, I did it for myself, but every single time I did this, it was noticeable to everyone else. It wasn't like, Hey, this is really working out for me. Everyone around me, like for instance, producers, instead of saying like, instead of checking on me every 30 minutes to see how things are going, they wouldn't even come by my desk anymore, Yeah, you know? And cause they were like, you know, and I would hear it in meetings, like Alan knows what he's doing. In fact, like Alan, like, can you like help everyone else out or whatever? And no, that's so true. It became like, it became so clear to everyone else, like these big growth periods that I would have. And it wasn't like I needed to point that out to anyone, but it was just like these little discoveries. So like one of them was, yeah, like I would finish my day early. I would decide what I wanted to do the next day because it's still fresh. I'm still having that momentum that it's just easy for me to think, okay, cool. This is where I finished up. This is what's next. One thing I started doing was I was emailing everyone as well um every day to let them know what i'm doing and I, the studio was that was a bit of a sweatshop so partially it was to cover my ass secondly it was to let everyone know where everything was here are all the render passes here's what's done here are the files everything and my whole philosophy was if this is annoying you delete the fucking email right but not a big deal at nine nine o'clock at night when the, the the nighttime flame composite is in and he's looking for something the coordinator the producer or him any or her anyone can just dig it up. I've got everything locked. And it was a positive thing. Like it, it definitely, uh, everyone looked at it as a positive thing. I could see some people may, may being annoyed at, you know, send all. No, no, know. don't even say it. Don't yeah. even say it. Cause I think the, it doesn't matter. Like you're, you're covering your ass, you know, like to the people that are, that you have a lot of students that listen to you and, and kind of follow you. And you've, you've talked a lot about trying to help them. And that kind of goes back, back to why you do the podcast. I think that is huge. Um, I think everybody that's listening should really take that in. And cause from my point of view of moving from an artist to being a producer or a boss or whatever you want to call me, um, I think that's amazing. And when the people do that, I got to tell you, the people that I do have the office that I just know are going to do their work, you're right. right. I don't go by their desk every tw- every 30 minutes. I know when to check in because I trust them and I know what they're, that they're going to be on task. You don't go and visit the guy that you know is doing what he needs to do. You go and visit the guy that's probably right. off track because you don't want to lose the hours. You don't want him sitting around mm-hmm. for two hours spinning his wheels. Um, yep. We always say, if you can't figure it out in 15 minutes, ask somebody mm-hmm. because it's just not worth you know the time. And if no one else knows, well, then you can go back to figuring it out. But most likely right. the guy sitting next to you with his headphones on probably knows the answer. Exactly. Um, so that's something good to talk about. So, you know, and this was all like in the same period. It's like these little, little slight tweaks that I did, but another one, um, fuck, I forgot now, is basically um, just kind of being more careful about myself communicating to others. Um, fuck, there was one really critical one I was just going to mention, but I'm completely spacing on now. Um, yeah, just in general, I would document everything. I would let everyone know what I'm doing. And yeah, something else I've forgotten. But there there was like... Come here. There was something else though, like later on when I launched a studio and I thought about this earlier today, um, it was a huge change for me. It was when I started managing other people and I did more management than anything else. But even when it was just me, when I decided to launch catastrophic and it was employee number one, Alan McKay, I would do everything in a spreadsheet and I would put everything in the spreadsheets. And that meant that, uh, yeah, I, you know, I would go in and update where things were. And it meant I could manage everything. I wasn't making mistakes because, you know, I I would have everything created in this like simple Excel spreadsheet that I could see this thing is finished. Uh, this thing is rendering. I better go check on it. Okay. This is done. And later if people were asking, where's this or this, I could see where it is. Or if someone needed something from me, they could even just open the spreadsheet. And this became like, um, just even as managing myself, it made me 10 X what I was doing, just starting to think like a producer. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, cause I think a lot of people like, I don't want to be a producer. They kind of, they're allergic to that. They want to be the opposite. They're like, I'm going to be 
3D artists. Like, fuck the management, fuck all those other people. And we need both, I gotta say. I feel like every artist needs to be a one girl or a one guy studio. Yeah. You know, like, you, if you start thinking of yourself as your own PR department, your own animation department, your own IT department, your everything, like your own clients. So you start critiquing your work without, you know, playing favorites. Like, look, is this good? And I thought about this this morning about um, a lot of people. I, I think one of the big things is everyone can tell you how good they are, like what their strengths are. Like, oh yeah, I'm great at all this stuff. And like, we're just before we hit record, we're talking about someone um, who I remember kneeling hiring one time and he was too busy telling me he's the best at you know, best at fume effects in the world, best at thinking particles in the world, best at everything in the world. And when I asked him what he's not good at, he couldn't think of that at all. He's just like, no, like there's nothing I'm not the best at. <laughs> and for me, it's just like, look, I can tell you every single thing that I'm not good at. And I think that it's really important to to figure that out, to like actually internalize and figure out where are my weaknesses? Because either it means that I can now go focus on them and get better at it, or it means that when I'm working on a project, this might be something that someone else can, I can hand over to them because they're magic at that. Like lighting, for instance, I can light shots, but I know me, if I'm, if I'm actually doing shots, then I'm going to get, I'd rather do 30 effect shots and I can do that because it's all my spreadsheet. I can fucking manage a lot of stuff at once. But what I like doing is teaming up with a really good lighter and they can just sit on my shots and make them look amazing. And they just do that. And I've done that on a few projects and it's fucking phenomenal. And meanwhile, I'm just doing so many other things at once. And that kind of teamwork, knowing my weaknesses is great. And the more you can do that, the more it makes you, I think, more in tune with yourself. Because it's easy to be like, yeah, I'm really talented at this shit. But what are you not talented at? I got, I got, I got, I got a couple of questions. You, you, I'll let you pick and choose the path that we're going to go next. One of my questions was going to be to ask um, about um, simulation and just to jump ahead and, you know, you talked about like having a spreadsheet doing 10 things at once. Because to me, the, the art of the guy that does the simulations, it's a multi, like it's a multi-threaded kind of thinking that mm -hmm. you're doing. A lot of times I, I try to explain to somebody what I'm doing and I'm like, it's going to take me more time to explain yeah. it than it's just, just leave me alone. I'm, I'm too busy corner. talking about rendering and trying to describe it to someone and I'm to say you got to simulate and then render or something like that's just. Right. <laughs> and, and simulation, I mean, you, it gets into so many levels of steps that you're doing mm -hmm. because a lot of times you know you, there's not a quick feedback loop on a lot of simulations yeah. there's a lot of simulating it half the time it's a fucking square and you gotta you know right and then you're waiting for even just a preview sometimes or you're waiting mm -hmm. for a render or you're waiting for some shadow pass to go so that you can put it back into the to the krakatoa so that you can render it out yeah. the right way and yeah. see it for real to see if you fix the bug um and then the other question so i was going to say i'd love to talk about that and some advice that you would give young guys that don't even understand really what that job is they, they, mm -hmm. they think they want to go into effects they think oh i've played around with a maybe a smoke system or something but it's just so it, it just kind of splays out that's one direction we can go um and the other one was going back to you said when you started catastrophic and we were talking about like what you learn at a facility. I wanted, I wanted to ask you a little bit about when you decided to make that leap into starting a studio. And now looking back, like mm -hmm. what, what was that the right move? Um, of course it was always the right move at the time, but like, mm -hmm. you know, there's, it's a different personality because I think you go from doing all the work and being the awesome guy yep. to now hoping that the guys you hire are the same as you yep. and you're going to be the awesome guy at managing, which is not always maybe everybody's talent. So I'm going to throw those two different paths out. We'll get to both of them. Which one do you want to tackle first? I'm still frustrated. I can't think of that one last thing that I was thinking about. <laughs> I was um, hoping to buy you some time so you could think I know, and I wasn't. Um, so simulating, I mean, one thing I realized in grade five was that I was a good problem solver. Um, I forget how, but problem solving was my thing. And one thing, because like right now I still work in production, but um, I decided to start dedicating 80% of my time to just really trying to get other people's careers where they should be able to go to. And um, one of the big things, like I teach a lot of advanced effects work and most people aren't prepared to problem solve. They prefer to say, here's my scene. Can you fix it for me? So I don't learn anything from it and I don't deal with it. And, you know, I'm going to then all I'm going to learn is to go to someone else to fix my problems. And the, the perfect metaphor for that is I've seen people who come to someone's desk and say, hey, I'm struggling. Can you come look at my file? And you get up from your desk, you go to their, their, their desk, and then as soon as you sit down, they get up to go get a coffee. And it's just like, <laughs> fuck you. Like, you. You want me to be doing your job, basically. So um, I think problem solving with, simula with anything to do with technical director stuff is critical. Like it's the number one thing is you need to be able to figure out like, why is this not working? And I've tried to like kind of, kind of teach mini lessons on that. Like, look, if I want to do this, if it's working, I try and break it 
until I get the result that I want. Or if it's broken, I just try and get that fixed and then I can go back, you know, whatever it is. But yeah. when you start to figure out these really simple formulas that you apply on a much bigger scale, it changes everything. Um, at the same time, like automating shit, like you're right. Like most of what we do, it's waiting around. And I remember there's this really funny quote from this studio in LA. Um, there's someone went for a job interview and they're, they're there for water simulations. They said, I know that simulating takes a long time. So I've got a big archive of movies because I know what it's like to have to like sit around for hours waiting for stuff. And it's just like, goodbye. Yeah. But that, that's just it. Like you've got to be really careful of your time. You've got to learn. To that's the thing is I don't think, foresight. you know, you said, you know, there's a lot of waiting around the joke you made. is totally relevant because I think um, like, I don't like waiting. Mm -hmm. absolutely not um my it's last scary when you can't see what the fuck you're doing yeah my last job i literally had three computers at my desk mm -hmm. because i got to the point where one of them wasn't enough and then the one that i was mainly using for email and everything i'd do some rendering and stuff i needed a second machine to sim and then like a third machine became available at the studio and it happened to be like the fastest one in the room and mm -hmm. i was a supervisor and i was like i'm taking that so i took on the third machine to do some serious processing and i got to tell you i almost always had them all busy Yep. And that's the one of those things that frustrates me when people are like, well, I was trying this, but it's taken a long time. I'm like, great. Well, then go do something else. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, there's another desk next to you and there's nobody in it. Mm -hmm. Go take over that machine and do that, do something with that or or look up something else. Or, that's a know, really good point. You could always be doing something to figure out that problem. You know, I'm, I'm In my head, I'm trying to think of 10 different things that I can try and condense down as short as I can. But like one of the things that Blur when V-Ray 3 came out became a rule of thumb is like, and at Blur, like people are not nice. Like I, I remember I set up a render one time, and it's a standard def, but it's like when you're just going through a look dev phase, everyone had to work as progressive because progressive you cap things out three minutes. But I'll come back, and someone will cancel my render. Not only that, have written like a, a a yellow sticket on my screen saying "fuck you," I canceled your renders, you know, and that'll be it. Because it took three minutes. Yeah, well, because like it's a bucket render instead of progressive. Whatever. Oh, right, this is right. kind of shit where you're like, who do I punch? No one signed this note. Right. It's just like, wow, like it kind of says something about that place and the people there. Love blur, but at the same time, like it's. We it's, could probably do twenty minutes on just render farm ethics. And, yeah, but, and... but that, this is it. Like it's <laughs> it's it's definitely cutthroat in terms of like just to defend that for a moment. But like it's definitely cutthroat there where it's like, look, there's no bullshit. It's just like this is how things are done. If you're gonna waste everyone else's time, then like get the fuck out and come back when. You know when you're gonna do it right and like so you would always get torn apart if like um you're you're wasting time you know your shit's not optimized or whatever and you gotta be respectful of everyone else the world doesn't revolve around you and when you're you wait until everyone goes home at night no one's there great 99 priority let me jump the queue and do all that kind of shit oh and that's that's something i want to key in like when when there's a young guy listening to this podcast and he's thinking like oh i got this good job i'm gonna do that i gotta tell you if if there is a farm and there's no job going on that night fucking use it mm -hmm. use it i used to use the farm for whatever i mean i just render shit just to render it i'd be like how far can i turn up the settings how much depth of field yeah. can i get in camera i would just render shit at night and over the weekends just because those machines were turned on so i just wanted to kind of chime in and no say, it's like, totally true and because the, the, those guys people notice you notice when, they, when you come in on monday morning and a guy's like well, what would you have going oh i did these crazy renders over the weekend this one failed but this one no configuration okay. see you like what works, that's what the kind of like chutzpah Mm -hmm. that you look for as an employer you look for that pe those people that are just going that extra like mile no I, I think it's really critical and at the same time like um like for me i i started always going coming to work at like four in the morning there's i don't know if you know chris harvey uh he's like does a lot of stuff with autodesk and discrete back in the like day. i do he's neil blomkamp's right hand man um i gotta get him on the podcast at some point but anyway like chris and i we've worked in four different countries together like i love that guy um and we made it a game we're on set for Superman and we wanted to link up with everyone in LA and Canada because we're in Australia. So like we'd, we'd make it a game to see who came in early earliest. So it'd be, it gets to four 15 in the morning or whatever. And like, we would always try and do that. But like for me, I started doing that where we're in such a shitty industry where, um, again, I thought about this this morning that like you're either working so much, you never see your spouse or if you're, you're actually get to see your spouse, it means that things are shaky and you need to be finding work right now. You know what I mean? And, and that's just one of those things that like, we work such shitty hours that I want to change it up. I want to have a sustainable life. So I'd rather go home at six o'clock at night and come in at four in the morning or five in the morning and work then because everyone, no one is working hundred percent capacity past six o'clock. They're all fucking goofing around with Nerf guns and pillow fights and, you know, talking about feelings, I don't know, and hanging out. And on top of that, like four o'clock, 
that's when the farm just starts getting backlogged with shit because everyone's just trying to fill it up for the night because yeah. they're good, good workers. Yeah, and, yeah, and they're, they're all trying it. to be good workers. So for me, coming in at four in the morning, the, the farm is pretty much free. No one is there to like come over and hang out and be like, hey man, let's get a, sneak out and get a beer or whatever. And you know, you can actually get shit done. And on top of that, like maybe I did have renders from the night before. I can come in, check them out. I was doing this on flight. I would look at them again and um, and be like, okay, cool. I'm going to sneak out another take before dailies at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock. And that yeah. would be my race to get that done. I, I'd almost get a day's worth of work done before anyone ever came in the morning. And it was just like my philosophy. But on top of that, I get to go home and be social with the people I care about rather than never going to see my friends. Rather than, rather than I remember like being single at Blur and like, meeting some people I really liked and I wanted to date and having to cancel five times in a row and just being like, I got to let this one go. Cause you know, this is a, I look a like joke at this point. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm being a total prick. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's just like, it's not sustainable. And so changing it around a little bit, like suddenly I had it all working for me. I would come in early instead of late and you know, you got to figure this shit out. You gotta be proactive and yeah, you, you know, there's all the, the rendering rules and things like that. Like don't rent a 2k and be a dick when you're, you're still in look dev mode yeah you're shit. still in the first round of renders and you render it at full res yeah um someone told me a story once it was actually about blur since you mentioned them and you mentioned tim and, and mm -hmm. the rules of like i love blur but at the same time they're they're the no bullshit kind of yeah well that's what everybody done. liked about yeah. blur i mean you know um the first t-shirts they had at the at the fuck you I, it, yeah. it was like fuck you and then it was like you know fuck your mother and then it was like fuck god and like all this fuck ik and all this shit exactly which was hilarious but um i remember somebody said they had a rule no Final renders can be any longer than 30 minutes, which was mm -hmm. a reasonable rule for a final render frame. But one of the guys that I know worked there, I swear it was Eric Pinkle, and he had taken a really, really high resolution screw. Like he designed this screw oh, okay. that was super high res, and he yeah. put it in um, um, in another guy's scene, and it was like ray traced. So the scene <laughs> would start to render, it would get halfway through the screen, and it would just crawl trying to figure out those like 10 pixels in the scene. And of course, you know, the other guy, I think it was Dave Campbell, and he, he just couldn't figure out for the life of him what the hell was going on. And it was killing him for like, you know, like two days maybe before he figured out, he just kept hiding things. And this is about problem solving. Like whenever somebody comes to me and says, hey, my scene won't render, I'm like, all right, sounds like you got a problem to solve. Like mm -hmm. you already know more than I do. How can I help? And my first, my first answer is like some of the obvious ones. It's like, delete half the shit out of your scene and render it. And they're like, but it's all put together. Yeah. yeah. You got to start hacking your scene and saving those as hacked versions of your scene and mm -hmm. throwing them out there and testing things. I was like, one of the first things is like import it into a new scene. See if it clears anything out, you know, delete half your shit, split it in half, figure which one renders, you know what yeah. I mean? Turn off a bunch of shit. I'm doing that. I'm going a brand new scene. I'm merging shit in one at a time. And that's that generalist stuff. Thrones, that's not I even. I like a corrupt file and it totally fucked me where I'm like, why is my shit crashing? I kind of merged to a new file. Turns out it's like one little helper node was causing my shit to crash and like, yeah. I wouldn't have ever figured it out if I wasn't merging one I'm sorry everything in except for one thing at a time starting with logical stuff and then illogical and it wasn't a logical thing yeah. where I got there oh, I'll, I'll talk about failures for one second the only time I've ever choked on stage <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I remember I was in Finland I was speaking at an event and I remember watching this guy uh, they're pitching their game studios to uh, their games to like um, this board and uh, you know, had like the guy for the, the CEO of Angry Birds, all these other people on there. They're all pitching um, their shit. And like, I remember seeing this guy choke, completely fucking choke. And he kept bringing it up. He's like, oh, there's a lot of people in this room. And he keeps bringing it up. And like, he's just fixating on like, there's a lot of people in this room. And because he was trying to figure out what to say next. <laughs> it was so painful to watch this guy. And a few months later, I was in Vegas. Uh, it was just after I started the podcast. And this, this was another life changing thing for me. <laughs> I love being like, move the, the glass of wine closer to the mic. Um, so this was a life changing thing for me where, uh, and I, I love that I invited all my friends to this talk, like Neil Blevins and Anzi and all these other people were there. And it's like, everybody come, come watch this amazing thing where I'm completely going to fuck up. And it, it, <laughs> it wasn't actually that bad, but in my mind it was, but basically, um, I, I decided at the time to do three different workshops for CG society. I, I was just about to launch my mentorship. I just launched the podcast and I was trying to do five episodes a week for the first couple of weeks. Uh, on top of that, I was doing a talk in Vegas and the whole time we were in Vegas for five days at Autodesk University, um, I was just hiding in my room because I was trying to build the ultimate talk. And this was essentially about 40 or 50 talks 
condensed into one. And on top of that, I never ever tried to actually script. What year was this? 2014. Okay. 2014. And um, yeah, on top of that, I was trying to script it. I was trying to speak like verbatim, like what I had written down. And I'd never done that before. And I don't, that's not my style. You know, like I, I know how to like create a perfect talk and execute it perfectly. And it's, it's more about practice, 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 but then bullets. And then, you know, so here I am, I have this fucking uh, gigantic, like 40 page talk. It's ridiculous on my iPad and then it auto formats it where it squeezes it all into one page. Like the lines are so small. I can't even read them. And I go on stage and um, I have so much on there and I can't even read my notes that I just completely like freeze up and I'm, I'm there trying to read and talk. And I'm, to me, I just had this one moment where I'm like, I'm that guy in Finland who's just like choking. <laughs> and that probably made it even worse when you had that moment. They yeah, well, no, it was, it was just this, I had this moment of internalizing where I'm like, fuck, I'm that guy. I'm like, I'm totally having a meltdown on stage right now. And it was just amazing for me to kind of like pause time and I'm like freaking out. And I'm like, fuck, that's, I'm, I'm him right now. This is me, I'm, I'm having a meltdown. And I just put my iPad down. Like as soon as I took my notes away, I just went, went and did my thing and it was, it was fine. Yeah. But to me that like five seconds or whatever they internalized felt like five minutes, yeah. five hours. And, um, yeah, it was just like, fuck. But at the same time, like it was this kind of wake up call where I got back to LA and I had all this shit going on. And I realized that like, there was more stuff I'm leaving out. And like, there was so much going on. I realized that it's all starting to unravel. Like I, I decided to not get greedy, but be too ambitious and take on too much stuff. And at this one moment, all of it is about to come crashing down. And that talk was the, the beginning, you know, right. the tip of the iceberg and it's all about to happen. So I decided to like look at it all and say, do I cancel it all? Do I just ride it through and like ruin my, my name, my reputation, everything, or do I intelligently make the hard decision to pull that one domino out that's going to cause it all to fuck up. And then I have everything manageable and I piss off a bunch of people for, for pulling out of one thing, but everything else is at the quality that I'm satisfied putting it out. So I did, I ended up backing out of one course, which um, definitely I'm, I'm sure upset a lot of people, but I, I, I pulled out of a course I was going to do on Houdini, but I found like one of my friends, he's a senior technical director at Weta. He's a fucking genius. And like I found the right person to take it over and like I made sure everyone was happy. I'm still sure I'm, I pissed off some people, but it meant that by pulling out of that one thing, everything else I was able to deliver a hundred percent. And so to me, that was a, this big epiphany where I had, where I decided 2015 was my year of no, where every single thing that came in my lap instantly, it was a no, unless I could convince myself like, yeah, I want to do this. And instead of saying yes, 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 which is my philosophy in the beginning of your career, say yes to everything. Richard Branson always says, say yes to everything and you'll be successful. Bullshit. That it's good in the beginning, but at some point you want to get to a point where you want to be able to say no to shit. And for me, that was it. And 2015, I tripled my revenue by saying no to more shit because it meant that when the right thing came along, I was able to say yes to that. Whereas in the past, like I've turned down the Matrix, Lord of the Rings, like you name it, every fucking ILM, like being effectively Transformers 2, good example. Like all these things I, I turned down because um, there was something else that popped up right before that. Girl, the dragon tattoo day before that, I agreed to do a shitty toy commercial, um, matrix. I was going to do this big hero shot for that, but day before week before that, I agreed to work on George of the jungle too, you know? So learning to have that patience and that faith that like, I was going to ask you about George of the jungle too, but we're going to pass on that question. I actually got three credits in that movie. How did you get three credits? Uh, I different titles. I did the title sequence, which was all cell animated. Um, and then. Uh, I don't know. I did like a bunch of different shit for that. Oh uh, yeah, I did like a bunch of live action VFX and other crap. Um, I have a couple more questions, and and we are we are like you said an hour and a half in. So I think uh, this is great, but yeah, you know. I'm gonna say these two. Um, I, I you know, one of these questions is a silly question. If you only had one tool to take into trying to complete an effect shot, what would it be, and why? Um, and it literally is saying one tool. But yeah, but what is the effect shot? I guess I, that's a good question. <laughs> that's, that's maybe you don't know ahead of time. This is just an oddball question I wanted to throw at you. Um, I've, I've always liked Fume just because it's, I don't know, like Nuke. Oh, that's interesting. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, because at the end of the day, like, you can, you can fucking... You can do like, a little bit of everything with that. You can render in V-Ray and fucking Nuke. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, like, um, comp is everything. Like, you finish shots in there, you pull off miracles in there. Like, okay, back in the 90s, you know, compositors were 
god it's like that's that's what they did is like nothing in 3d came out good you you'd hand this pile of shit to someone mm -hmm. and then later you're getting props because like you know you see it on tv and it's like holy shit like you did that that's amazing and it's like you don't want to see what it looks like before. yeah i i really think that like you know compositing is like the swiss army knife like it's it's where you save shit so you, you save a shot so well, uh tell me about branding do you think all artists need to need to brand themselves i know it's something you've gone through i feel like i did it early on in my career mm -hmm. like putting together a website a blog i, I did a blog a couple of times one one time my blog got taken by a I want to say a porn website and then because it's called rough stuff. No, I was about to say roughstuff.com. Yeah. I was, I think I was, it was just a, about to beat you too. I think it was a sanding company after that that took it or something like that. But yeah. um, do you think branding is important for all artists? Or do you think mm -hmm. that there are some artists that just, they don't have to go through that? I never realized experience. that I was doing it. Like, cause I look at certain people and I'm like, yeah, you're, you know, you're definitely very strategic and conscious of it. I didn't realize that I was doing it, but at the same time, like it's, <laughs> really <laughs> no it, it's kind of funny because like um like chad one street is one of the vfx soups at um fuse and uh yeah i, I remember catching up with him when he first moved to la and he's just like you know you are a brand you know and he at the time this is 2014 he and so many other people are all saying at the same time like i hadn't really ever thought about that and it was only around then i started to be more conscious of it but like you know i I, I will say with the podcast, I was going to call it the Artist Insight Series because I had done a video thing prior to that, which, um, you know, I want to continue on. But I felt like at the same time, at that point, I, I did want to start unifying everything and consolidating it all. And so why would I want to go and create an additional thing, catastrophic, right. Alan, this, 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 and this, and now podcasts, like why not bring it all together? So like, you know, Alan McKay podcast to me sounds a bit pretentious, but it's reinforcing that brand that I'm, that I'm doing. So it makes sense. For me, like my whole thing is that I think that everyone should be treating themselves as a, a one girl or one guy studio. You know, if you do that and you start thinking about like, well, I gotta, someone's going to look after the artist. If, if I'm the artist, then, you know, who's going to protect me from getting screwed over? Um, who's going to be looking for new work? You got to start doing all these different roles. And one of them definitely is marketing. Uh, I always say like, you could be the best artist in the world, but if no one knows who you are, how are you going to get work? I said it a, a, a thousand times because... I stand by that, and it's so true. Though I think that um, I think that it's very important to to think about that because I look at it this way: uh, in 2005, there was a day where I didn't have any work and I wanted work, so I sent an email to an email list, and then I had calls all afternoon. But prior to that, like I don't know, 2004, 2003, that was around the last time I ever applied for a job in my life. And for me, um, most of the time, it's you know lunches like we went to lunch yesterday Fuck, that was only yesterday jesus uh you know it's just like natural meetups and everything else or i just check my inbox and like this morning it's like three or four things are in my inbox and it's more just organically things happen and it's because you're you're putting in the time to get to know people and you're doing it all genuinely you're not going out there hey if i wish i had a collar right now i could pop up but <laughs> you know you're instead just genuinely going out you're helping others you're you're doing your thing but you're you're being active. And I always say, again, you got to be in it to win it. And that's because, you know, a lot of people are afraid of success. They're afraid of failure, but the people are afraid of failure. I guarantee you're not going to fail if you don't ever try, but yeah. you're never ever going to get anything either. So let's say you're going out and you want to meet a guy or a girl that night, then that's not going to happen if you stay at home. But you know, you're, you're not going to get rejected if you stay at home, but at the same time, you might meet the love of your life. You never know. Same thing with work and everything else. If you don't do it, you don't know what's going to happen. And yeah, yeah it's you just got to put yourself out there, get out of your comfort zone, just be naked out in the world, and see no, what I, comes. You think know, of think of the end of Unbreakable when Bruce Willis goes out into like uh, uh, what is Grand Central Station and he's just got his arms out and he's just touching people. It's kind of creepy now you think about it, but he's putting himself out there and, and hoping that he finds a criminal he can go fuck his shit up. You know? <laughs> I think um, when I, it's funny because I, I, every once in a while I get random emails like, you know, a compositor will, you know, hey, I'm looking for work or uh, an artist will, hey, I do storyboards, I do artwork. And I got to say, I put those people above everybody else. If mm -hmm. I have to go look for you, it's, you know, great. I found you. But when you come looking for me, um, that's awesome. So I do get those emails, you know, like you said, when you reach around looking for work and like, you know, I'm trying to find something. Um, I put those people at to the top of my list because they're hungry and I mm -hmm. think they're going to do the extra level. 
I think it's hilarious when somebody sends me an email. Like I got an email recently and it was like, hey, I do voiceover. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. I need something mm-hmm. right now. Never heard back from them. Really? Yeah. Like for a week, I was just like, you just sent me an email. I literally was on my computer. I, I responded five minutes later and you never responded. That pisses me off. Um, there's nothing pisses me off more than... Like, I won't work. Here it is. And they're like People that you crickets. go to and yeah, you're like, hey, I'm going to give you a job. And then they're like, eh, you know, they get back to you. Or, <laughs> or worse, like there's someone who like, I've had people say, I listen to your podcast all the time and I've learned everything. And then I decided to give them a chance. And then, yeah, they're like, oh, yeah my friends in town this weekend and uh you know i think that you know i'll get back to you next month or whatever the fuck yeah it's yeah like, they just don't dude, have the time you're, you're fucking up my so, last question i'm gonna give you well i want to ask you a question really quick oh, so okay it's, it's what fun. are the um the the top red flags you've had when people apply for jobs like the ways they screw up okay a good generic example is cc'ing every other studio on the same one email. You know? <laughs> so I'm just setting the tone of like, you know, what are some of the big fuck ups that like, see, that's not a fuck up though. If you send me an email and you've CC'd 12 of the studio owners, I, I, I know you're doing that anyhow. You know what I mean? So it's not the worst fuck up. And I've had that happen. Well, it, it's showing that you're lazy. Like if you're, you're saying to whom may concern and you've made a mistake. Blatantly CCing everyone. I feel like that's just like, you know, if that's what you think is acceptable, then like, what, what are you going to do for, you know, are you going to, Render all your shots from the same. Uh, all That's the one way to look at shots. it. One way to look at it. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I think I'm a little soft. I mean, I'm from New York. I tend to be hard. I'll drop a lot of f bombs, and if you piss me off, I'll go. You know, I'll tear you apart. New York is nothing in Australia. <laughs> but I do tend to be soft, so I will give people a chance. I'll give you a second chance. I'll even give you a third chance if I feel like you deserve it. You know, mm-hmm. or, or or maybe there's a chance that you'll come around. I did have an artist one time. Um, he mentioned something and it was fucking hilarious because we all heard it and I looked at him and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And he was like, um, it was something about like, we were working on a shot and he was like, uh, it was something like, you know, I can't wait to do that for my reel or something like that. Mm-hmm. It was a comment and I can't, and I'll have to ask some of the other guys about how it was said, but it was like, you know, I'll do that for my reel. And we all were like, this isn't about your reel. Mm-hmm. This is about the client. And I think immediately when he said it, he realized, oh, shit like that's not why i'm here Mm -hmm. you know like tell me that you're gonna put the time in that i'm paying you to work on your reel no fucking way the time you're here and i'm paying you you're gonna work on making me proud to show the client what we've done as a team Mm -hmm. um i I say that all the time like to to my guys i say like if i'm struggling with something and i'm not ready to show it to the client that means that i'm struggling with the work you're doing so we need to come together and figure out the best the best way to show this to the client so that I'm so fucking proud mm-hmm. that I don't have to like defend it or caveat or anything like that. You look better on Monday. You, yeah, I, I you know like we we just work in the other day and 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 we I told them to do something and they did it and I told them to do something else and they did it and the result was just not awesome. Mm-hmm. And I kept trying to say I was like guys this doesn't look awesome and they looked at me like staring at me like what do you what do you want to do? And I, I was like, I'm going to go in my office for an hour. And I went in my office and I put just... Put the shop and just, filter on and... No, I threw it players. all away. I threw it all away and started over. That's and the it, best way. And it started with a new background. And the background was just a gorgeous image that I wanted to put our CG over. Mm-hmm. And that was the answer. It was like, let's focus on, you know, we have a short amount of time to, to show this client something. Let's make the background amazing. And sure enough, we did it. And I was like, all right, guys, now you guys finish it. Mm-hmm. I've tested it out. This is going to work. You guys go polish it. And then we showed the client. They loved it. So that's um, great. You know, I'll, I'll segue for one second and we'll get to your question, but that's actually a good point. Like, um, atomic fiction. I really love They are on my frantic films too. When frantic died, Kevin and Ryan came along and I fell in love with those guys. And I remember on transformers, there's this one particular shot, which, you know, it was, it was a shot that Michael Bay ended up saying that like your explosions are too big, you know, cause I, I did massive fucking car explosion it was it was insane i remember telling kevin like this is the best explosion i've ever done at the time and um yeah it's just you know it i I feel like with visual effects sometimes you've got to work in a certain direction and figure out what you want and it takes you know a week or whatever of like going in the wrong direction of to eventually for everyone to be clear about okay now we know what we want and so in that particular case i remember on that show uh we got to a point where Finally, we realized that like we didn't actually want an explosion. It was more about like all these other elements. There's more pyro. It was like flames and glass and sparks and 
other shit. Isn't so it's kind of interesting. It's just like basically the shot kind of evolved to a point where it was so complicated, so over the top, and all this shit going on. And then we kind of all kind of realized like where it needed to be. And Kevin made a call, which I thought was really great, which basically he's just like, all right, like, do you want to start again from scratch? And, you know, we know what we want now. Let's just start from scratch. And he wasn't saying it in an offensive way because I, I agreed 100%. I'm like, yeah, you're right. So, like, I was able to get it approved in one take from scratch because we needed to go to that point. You know, we need to take it in all these other directions. Did the producer flip the table? Like, why are you fucking kidding me? No, and, and that was the cool thing. Is like we didn't have a producer. It was two artists who ran a company who grew up with George Lucas mentoring them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, like, we were all on the same page. Like, everyone – actually, that was one thing I wanted to talk about, which I won't, but, like, when you talk about nerve-wracking stuff with uh, the teams and things like that, I always hired seniors in the beginning. Like, I always hired seniors. I'd pay them a fortune – but it meant that we were all senior people and we could all read each other's minds. We all knew where things were going and this, it was just magic working together on those projects. And to me, Transformers was like that. Everyone there was like ex Tippet, ex ILM, ex Orphanage. You know, it was, it was it was amazing. It was such a great collaboration. It was the dream team. That's cool. And um, so the cool thing is, that, you know, basically you got to the point where it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll start from scratch, redo it. We know what we want now and I'll do it. And one take approved because it needed to get to that point. It wasn't because I had that a few years before first job I ever did in LA. I redid the entire project. I didn't sleep for three and a half days, redid the entire job from scratch, um, knowing what everyone wanted at the very end. And after three months on the job as an effects lead, the owner of this other studio in LA dog shit studio, um, I'm surprised it's still even around. Um, I remember him, the owner saying, if you did this in three and a half days, what have you been doing for the last three months? And it was just like this point where I'm like, I'm so ready to punch you. Meanwhile, he's trying to vet, he's trying to hire me and Chris Harvey, telling me I'll be the biggest visual effects supervisor in Hollywood if I work for him. All this kind of shit. And it's like, well, why would you hire me if apparently, or, you know, yeah, yeah. The, all that kind of shit. So um, I just like the fact that we could all appreciate, like, look, we're at this point, start from scratch, one take. The cool thing was, and the reason I bring it up is that on flights, there's this one shot that it was just getting art directed to hell, like where literally the art director is painting this shot of an engine exploding it's in the trailer of flight and um yeah it kept going around and around and around where it, where it's like match the painting to a t and that wasn't the last time i got told to fucking simulate a painting <laughs> but um uh, uh, you know with those guys but like with that it was really interesting because we noodled it to death we finally figured out what we wanted and i love kevin because he was in dailies and he's like remember in transformers that shot that like you know we got to this point where like you know Let's just start from scratch. We know we're Burn it out. all down, literally. Because yeah. we all down. we all needed to get to that point. We all needed mentally to know what we wanted to do. And and I was like, yeah, you're right. Fuck yeah, and nailed in like one or two takes after that. Yeah. Because like we all needed to. You know, it's like when the client says, "I don't know what I want, but I know what I yeah, want but when I, I don't see it. want. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know. I know, I'll know what I want when I see it. <laughs> well, this is us. Like we had to finally see what we um you know what we didn't want, and then we could actually go and make what we wanted. So I like that. I like the fact that we were all able to approach it that way where it wasn't like, it wasn't a bad thing. It was like, no, this is the evolution. We all got that. Yeah, thing. sometimes the evolution yeah. goes backwards. Uh, yeah. I think even evolution branches a tree off and then goes, nope, that didn't work. We need mm -hmm. to go all the way back to the beginning it's of that branch. It's all about failures, you know, or... Exactly. Not that no, I see, that was good. Not that was that, one of my questions. I see them as failures, but I, I do think that failing, there's nothing wrong with that. And I think that people need to stop seeing failures as failures. No, I, you learn from a yeah. failure and that's what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. The last question I had was, where do you see the um, effects um, going? Uh, where do, oh, where do we I see it going for the future? I thought you were going to see, say, where do I see myself going? No, like, no, I'm not going to ask that. You can, no. you can deal with that off, <laughs> off, off mic. I'm working on that. Where do you see VFX going? Do you have any, any insight? It's, it might be a very simple answer. It might be... That's such an open-ended, totally. cheesy, lame fucking question. <laughs> it is. It's, no, 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 it's not. Because it, you probably don't think about it a lot because you're in it all the time. If you imagine like seeing the technology that's coming out, where do you extrapolate all this going? I see the British Columbia stopping their incentives, the bubble bursting, <laughs> turmoil. Are we going to uh, bring work know, back to the U.S.? Is that it's what's such a happen? fucking. I know U.S. is going to stabilize now. Finally, um, it will, three years ago it was shaky, um, and that's the thing. I was about to resurrect catastrophic in L.A. 
And I was like, this, I'll be the dumbest person on the planet to start a studio, no offense. No, I started a studio, I'm kidding, but I uh, started yeah. a studio in LA at that time. And I stand by that. And that's why I kind of ventured off into working from home for a bit. Um, it's such an open-ended thing. So, you know, the industry is globalizing, which I think is really, really cool. I don't like that there was LA and London before. Now it's, now LA is not the capital. Vancouver is the capital. And I was talking to Ben Snow about this, that like, before you would outsource work to India and to Vietnam and all these other places. And typically it meant you're doing that because you want cheap bottom of the barrel stuff. These days, like every country is getting a chance to do amazing stuff. And like, just because it's being done in India or something doesn't mean that it's not going to be amazing work. And there's companies in China and India doing phenomenal work. So I love the fact that now it's, it's kind of more of an even keel thing. Um, the reason I started the podcast was essentially to kind of give people the tools to say like, because most people think that career stuff is not sexy. It's like, no, I, I just got to get better at ZBrush and then I'll get the job offers I want and everything else. And it's, it's like, no, like, you got to learn the brand. You got to learn to negotiate. You got to learn to plan projects and manage everything. And I think that with all of this, I think that that's a critical thing that now we're, we're getting to a point where, um, you know, you have studios like, yeah, you've got all the, VFX is crumbling and all this kind of shit. And my whole philosophy, that's, that's what I mean. You're asking like, what's the meaning of life? And it's like, fucking <laughs> let me go through every single philosophy. But let me just quickly say like, um, people always talk about VFX crumbling and all this kind of shit. And like, we need to unionize. And like my whole thing, and this is why I started the podcast was, and this is going to get deep for a second, but like there are certain people, certain specific people who are making a lot of money going around being the face of, we need to unionize. We need to band together. We need to do all this shit. Because they're looking to get paid by all these other parties to be responsible for all the shit. And like, end of the day, like, unionizing is not going to work at all. And on top of that, like... No, I, I don't know how unionizing would help me as a studio get more work. All it takes is like 99% of all the studios get together and say, you're right, we're going to band together. And then one studio is going to say, well, I'm not. I'm going to be fucking rich because everyone's going to give me all their work now because I'm the one person who is not playing by the rules. So no matter what, like it's never going to work. The only way that things would disrupt and work is if it all crashed. In other words, it got so bad eventually that everything just fell fucking apart and it went rock bottom. Then you can renegotiate. Then you can reestablish things. And it's not going to get that way. No. Um, things are stable enough. It's not going to get that way. And what I do like, though, is that all these studios, because I, I try not to debate with people ever. And I, for once, I broke my rule and I debated with someone about... We're almost done. I debated with someone about um, the state of the industry because I had all these people copying out all the time, like the studios are the bad guys and blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, no, like you're just using it as an excuse to bitch and moan about stuff. Um, the production studios, you know, Fox, Paramount, you know, the big five, they are the bad guys in the sense that, yeah, they make a billion dollars from Fast and the Furious and then Pixamondo and everyone else, you know, gets, Scanline gets a small chunk of the pie. Um, so yeah, they're the bad guys, the studios of anything. And this is where I've had to explain this a lot to other people is that if anything is, it's more VFX studios usually are the martyrs. Like you're putting it all on the line. Like if, if you don't deliver your job as an employee, worse that happens is you get fired. Maybe you don't get paid some shit like that. The studio, and this goes into any field, like you as the boss, you're liable. You're the one who's got to go find work. You're the one putting everything at risk. You're the one who is putting in all the extra time, uh, gambling with every fucking job. And you're typically not going to make a huge amount of money um, except for like the random job with the random client. That's amazing. But like, you know, I feel like it's, it's more stable as an employee than it is to be a studio. No, you're probably right. And we got um, software costs. Yeah. There's like all this overhead. Yeah. And employees don't think about that because everyone wants to be a boss. So, or they bitch and moan like, oh, I should be getting more money because like, you know, fuck my boss and all this. And it's like, you don't get it. So, when I look at that, though, I think that in this day and age, things are changing so much where I love the term, uh, what is it, disruptive innovation. So taxi drivers are all freaking out because of Uber. Like all these things are changing so drastically. Instead of going and flying with Delta, you can get a private jet with a fucking app now. And um, <laughs> okay, I don't know about that one. I, I, I so want to do that soon because it, it's pretty affordable. Um, so uh, I'm going to Vegas end of the month, actually, for SEMA. So, <laughs> so um. What I like is that uh, I kind of, 
use the term next level artists because I look at guys like um, Ash Thorpe, Andrew Kramer, all these other people who are guys who I just say that there's people out there making seven figures as an artist, getting to pick and choose their projects. They're able to um, brand themselves well, take down the jobs they want to do, live the life they want, travel where they want, do whatever you want to do. And most of us, 99% of us don't even know that's possible to go and fly around and get it all paid for, get your hotels paid for, get a per diem just for sitting in a hotel doing nothing. Um, literally pick and choose the jobs that you want to do. Uh, renegotiate your rates and keep ramping them up. Like go from 25 an hour to 100 an hour within a year because you're just constantly renegotiating. All of these things, like you've got complete control as an artist and we don't do that because we think that that's not even possible. So the key thing is that like with all this innovation and disruptive innovation going on right now, like we have the, we have the pick of the litter. We can do what the fuck we want to do. If we want to go and make a movie, or let's say a short film, we don't need to go and save up our money and do all this stuff. We'll go on fucking Indiegogo or Kickstarter and we'll get it funded. If we want to go and make, a, we want a feature film direct. And I love the fact that you got Wes Ball, Tim Miller, Rory Robinson, all these other guys who came from 3D and here they are directing feature films and doing what they love. And they came from 3D, they created their own path for doing that. And it gives us hope. And the thing is, you can do all that. You don't need permission from Fox to go do it. You don't need permission um, and, and the backing and to make sure like, well, shit, I wanted to make a movie that was original and now I'm doing this Forrest Gump in space or whatever. You know, we we're talking about movie ideas yesterday and like that that's just it. Like um, you don't need to sell out and do all this. You can do what you want to do because you can bypass all of that. And that's why I love about Amazon, Netflix, all these other places uh, uh, even Hulu is funding all these different shows and you don't even need any of that. Like uh, Rory got uh, Leviathan uh, picked up and now Neil Blomkamp's producing that. Put a fucking trailer together of his own money, actually got Ireland to fund it and um, the Irish government, Irish film government. And um, yeah, he got that funded, made a sh uh, trailer, put it on YouTube, told all the producers, have at it. Uh, it's going to come out at midnight, you know, highest bidder wins. And here he is making a feature film on on this, you know, yeah. uh, whatever the concept was, the uh, fucking whale, Moby Dick, Moby space. Dick, Moby Dick in space. But <laughs> I, I really think that we're at a point now where, like, even yesterday, I got approached by uh, this uh, huge amount of guys at ILM who are doing a short film, and they showed me the boards. It looks fucking amazing. And like, I actually mentioned to my assistant, I was like, "This is how you pitch someone." Like, they they fucking did it perfectly everything from the, the breakdown to the email everything but like like hey we're doing this thing we've got 30 amazing artists on board here's all of our work would you be interested in just doing a shot and i was like this is fucking amazing like i don't care whether it's paid or not like i want to be a part of it and like you can have all these tools now to do all this shit that you can have people in la london all these other locations all over the world collaborating on film projects you can go make a film get it picked up um, get it made, get it crowdfunded. Like we have all these tools that we don't need to go and and do the traditional route of bullshit um, that typically is done. Like you can go and fund your stuff to get done. You can go and get all the tools you need. Uh, all the software is free these days. Um, just everything. Like I work remotely. I moved to Portland. I didn't even bat an eyelid. I got there. I had dinner with you, and I was like, "So what's the industry like here?" I hadn't even done any research, <laughs> you know, and. My answer was probably like, well, what does that matter? <laughs> so, because I support you. I mean, I, I think the idea of remote work, I, I mean, my clients don't need to be in Portland. I, I've turned wherever. down, I've turned down double digits this week. It's Tuesday today. So, the amount of work I turned down this week, you know, I'm living in Portland and it doesn't fucking matter where I am. And when I lived in LA, I work from home. It didn't matter there. It doesn't matter here. Yeah. And that's just it. Like, we've got all the tools to do that. I'm working on my own stuff to try and um, streamline a lot of remote work at the moment as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's one studio in San Fran that was trying to create a whole remote studio called Scarecrow years ago. I don't think it really worked out too well. But um, what I love is that you don't you don't need to move to Vancouver or LA. You can do it from anywhere. We've got all the tools. If you want to be a filmmaker, you just need to go on the web. It's all fucking there. Yeah. You know? So it's the it's, future's a, it's, a long, it's a long spiel, but like, but I mean it though, like. You could go and be a feature film director. You just got to go and make a short film. Collaborate with your buddies. A good one. Put it on YouTube. Think about branding, how to launch it, how to get it all going. Um, two of the, a few of the guys at ILM dubbed the Alan McKay effect because I didn't really ever think about this. And recently, uh, for the first time ever, I started clicking like on random videos on Vimeo and, and uh, YouTube. And then 
people's reels would go from like 20 views to a couple of thousand. So that's where like, my friends were like, because one of the, the senior TDs at Weta was like, dude, like I'm getting all this traffic ever since you clicked the like on my reel. And then the <laughs> same deal with, you know, all that kind of shit or um, doing a live stream and I mentioned someone and hundred, you know, someone is in the chat. They're like, hey, Alan. And I'm like, oh, dude, I love this guy. He's one of my best buddies. He works at ILM. 20,000 friendship requests, you know. So, but that's just exactly it. Like the more you understand how the shit works, it's like you can strategically say, because I'm actually going to put out a, a video soon on how to growth hack your reel. So in other words, like if you want to get a job, here's how you get your reel viewed by 10,000 people or whatever, nice. like, you know, a week, you know, and you just learn all the shit. So you ask about branding. Well, yeah, fucking branding your shit, but also marketing your shit is going to mean that you get visibility and that's what you want. The more people who know you, uh, the better. If you can get, uh, let's say, three or four people email you within 10 minutes of each other from the same studio, you know you've done something right because it means that they're in a meeting and they're like, shit, maybe we can get Fred Ruff for our project. And then they all go and independently email right, you. Right, right. And that's what you want. You want someone to say, well, we need a real flow person. Fuck, maybe we can get like so-and-so, you know, maybe they're available, you know. And the more you can kind of associate yourself with these things and the more you can do all that to get that visibility, then... So this is know. a good time to plug Refuge VFX and Refuge on Twitter and yeah. Instagram. No, um, <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 you know I, I like the fact that like what you guys are doing, like, um, you know, you, you've created a successful studio, you've created, you know, a, a good close-knit family of people there as well. And you, you're doing cool shit. We're trying so. not to work all kinds of crazy hours. And we mm -hmm. talked about that earlier. Something that like when I started my shop, I was like, we're going to work normal hours. I have a kid. I have an ex-wife. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's part of the equation. But, you know, she's a good person. And, she and comes she's with the kid. My kid. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I have people that work for me that have lives and they have mm -hmm. kids too. And I think like I've always thought, I'm like, why would you pay overtime? How many beer breweries are in your like next – like in your property, <laughs> just one, just one. Okay, I thought it was brewery, like two. But, but it's Portland, so they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, but I've always said, like, why would you want to play like overtime when you could just have more people for less mm -hmm. hours? So we've tried to as our as our shop. I, I do hear all the, the stories about working crazy hours and all that. And I'm like, the only time I do that is when I really care about the project. Mm -hmm. But I can't ask my employees to do that because I have to pay them. I have to pay them overtime, mm -hmm. and overtime is expensive. Overtime hours are time and a half. I don't want to pay that. Yep. So I always thought like just just hire more people during the hours that you are open and do that work. And so far we've been able to do that. I mean we've had a couple like weekends where we've had a crunch through, but like I think it, that you just have to plan for it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really do believe that that maybe it's because we're not dealing with million dollar movies that need to be done to the nth degree and make the director happy. We've done a lot of television work, you a lot get of a little decent budget stuff, stuff, and a lot of commercial stuff. So mm -hmm. we're not going crazy work until you know you know four in the morning just because. It's not, it, like you said, it's not sustainable, so. I'm going to tell you a quick story, um, which I think is just hilarious. This is a guy, good buddy of mine, DJ. He, um, he's from Detroit, and I knew him in Australia. And, and um, but he basically, he's always experimenting with shit, and he decided he wanted to try polyphasic sleeping, which is essentially every four hours you sleep for 20 minutes. And I think you get like four hours sleep a day. Or no, it was like two hours sleep a day, something like that. So essentially... You're kind of hacking sleeping so that way it's meant to be able to work so that way you you're essentially be able to get like more Time. hours out of your day and you'll be able to function and like it was just amazing like watching this whole thing unravel but like originally he came to me he's like hey alan like i, I want to work with you on a job and and i end up hiring him for this commercial and um i just remember him being excited like oh yeah i'm doing this polyphasic sleeping as well so like I could literally work 24 hours a day. And I'm like, no, I don't want that. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, don't I, I just need to like sleep on the couch every once in a while. The couch is in the lobby to this studio where we had like, it wasn't just my studio. It was like all these other studios collaborating in the same space. And I'm like, no, I do not want like some deadbeat sleeping on the couch in the middle of the day <laughs> when clients coming in and out all day long. And um, yeah, it was a nightmare because like, I told him like, I don't want you to work crazy hours. And he did because he had nothing else to do. He flew up from Sydney to Brisbane and he's, He's up there and he had nothing to do. So he's just working ridiculous hours. And then we'd go out and party and like he'd go to sleep at the bar, like just 20, sleep, minutes. 20 minutes, wake up. <laughs> or he'd get in a taxi and say, just drive around. And I remember one time it was in the middle of Sydney on a Friday night and he couldn't get a taxi, which is pretty common. And he ends up just like, he would have these major mood swings. And he starts chasing after a taxi, punching the cab, <laughs> you know, and the, I remember the, the cab driver was like, you're an animal. And, you know, screaming it out. And like, it was just a fucking nightmare. But I, I look at DJ, he's, he's always trying just 
the weirdest experiments, you know, and, and that was like one that, you know, he's like, I could work 24 hours a day. And it's just like, I don't want you to. And, you know, he, he was fine. It's just, <laughs> fuck. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's not the future of the industry is, is doing yeah. polyphasic sleeping. Well, I wrote Overtime Plus Productivity, right? And um, I wrote that article. I, as far as I'm concerned, I've only written three articles in my life. I wrote that. And it was just my way of saying after doing 2012, like, look, killing your artists is not the way to go. Um, this is going to change. Like you think that tricking them, like, oh, the deadline's tomorrow. Then they, they kill themselves. And the next day it's like, oh, it's actually a week from now. Haha. -ha, but we got a few extra hours work from you. That shit isn't going to make them do better work. Eventually they're going to get disgruntled. They're going to want to quit. On top of that, the work, the quality of the work that they're putting in just starts to decline because they're not thinking straight. They're, yeah. you know, relationships are distracting them, you know, all the kind of shit. So I wrote this thing. And I, I put it out there as the first in my, I, I've written dozens of hundreds of articles for magazines, stuff like that. But for me, this was the first time I had written an article for me. And I put that out there and I remember I was in New York at the time and I expected so much backlash from like studio owners, producers, supervisors. And it was the other way around. Um, every single person was so supportive. I had Framestore, MPC, uh, Buck in New York, um, Pixamondo in China, like all these different, this cat is such a, Anyway, there's a cat on the table and she doesn't even yeah. let you pet her. She's just like, get She's away saying from me. She's saying we're done. Yeah. So I wrote this article. And um, so what ended up happening is um, I had full support. Everyone, like all these producers were all emailing me. And it was just like, yeah, like you were so right. You know, we're going to change things. And all these studios started changing their policies. Like the mill, um, I think it might have been the mill in London. Or no, it was Framestore in London, the mill in New York. They all started changing their policies and how they did stuff. And even just recently, I, I um, spoke to our man at a main road post in Russia. And like, that was, again, like one of many, many places that all were changing, like how they were doing things based on this article. I thought it was, it was just fucking cool to see this. And even the studio I was at, I remember I was on the phone yelling at a client who owed me money from like a year ago who still hadn't paid me. And um, I'm on the phone and out of nowhere, this giant pink ape comes in the studio. Cause one of the things was like, I was saying how, you know, even if you can't pay overtime, paying for people's dinners or paying for just stupid distractions, like showing your appreciation goes so fucking far. Yeah. And just that little thing, if you can't pay someone time and a half, the least you can do is buy their meal and all these other things. And like, it's such a sleight of hand in a lot of ways, but the appreciation makes people feel like they want to care again. And so this pink ape came in as a singogram and she's saying, you are my sunshine in his pink ape suit. And so it's basically this person in a pink ape suit comes in, sings a song and then leaves. And this happens in five minutes. And it's like, what the fuck? And within minutes, every studio in New York is hearing about what's going on. And that was because, um, Orion who owns Buck, you know, he, he sat me down like the same day and he's just like, I read the article and I'm like, Oh shit. And he's like, yeah, this is, you know, that's what really inspiring. We, uh, for the last season of, of Grimm, um, for the last like four episodes we were working on, I pulled in a massage therapist twice mm -hmm. a week. Yep. Twice a week, and she was going to do 15 minute sessions for That's three great. hours a day. And it was awesome. And I, I, the only thing I hated was the fact that sometimes I forgot to get my massage. <laughs> <laughs> so, literally, I had her come in, and everybody just kind of signed up on a list. She did about 10 massages in the time she was there. Um, and it was awesome. And people loved that. You know what I mean? And it made them feel appreciated. They were mm -hmm. like, they would stop, and it was 15 minutes. And they get a deep tissue like back massage on a table in the edit room, totally darkness, oh, yeah. quiet. And then they come out and be like, all right, let's go. And, I, and it was like one of the best things I could ever do. And I, I would do it again in a second. And people would hear about it too. Like, yeah. Word of mouth. No, I've heard people come back and they're like, man, Fred, out of all the studios I've worked for in Portland, like I love mm -hmm. coming back to work for you. So coming back and I was like, hey, that's cool. I'm all about it. That's what I want to do is have people like want to come to work because they work better when they're excited to come back. So the final question I have for you is if you had one more question to ask, what would it be? <laughs> I'm kidding. I went through them all. I got all those questions out of the way. So, I mean, I don't know. It's kind of weird because, um, I don't know, I, I feel really wired tonight. It's kind of hard to kind of just with everything going on. So it's kind of hard to go back and think clearly about a lot of um, my past or anything else. But, I mean, I've enjoyed shooting the shit and kind of talking about the stuff. But, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully there's some Have movies, me back again. You know, have me back again. I, I we always, need to do a panel one time. I want you to have three of us. Well, Find three people and let's, get in a room. Let's, let's organize. I mean, we've, do a panel. we've talked about this stuff. So, like, let's organize. Um, yeah, we've, we've talked about a lot of this stuff, in fact. So, one thing I'm going to be doing pretty soon is going to be hosting a Seattle drinks and a Portland drinks. But you're now the 
VP of Sigaroff chapter? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, like the slightly non-existent ch- chapter of Sigaroff that's here in Portland but like, that we're going to try to bring yeah. up to some kind of level. I'll make the next one. I think Game of Thrones one. was um, preventing me from coming to the last one. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm down for... And I'll have drinks in Seattle. I like Seattle. It's a good reason to get out of town. I just want to see the train up there. I think it'd be pretty cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, thanks again, man. Well, thank uh, you. Thanks for having me. Get the hell out of my house. This has been fun. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, it's been awesome, and um, yeah, I mean, hopefully, there's a lot that we've gone over that might, you know, I, I like kind of talking about the vulnerable shit that I probably haven't spoken. About I know before. we're getting into some deep stuff. Yeah, well, I try not to piss too many people off while doing it, but I mean, I do think that like talking about your failures, because again, most people don't talk about stuff. Um, I love talking about the taboo shit. Like in Paris, I just talk. I actually presented a talk where I, I listed every single salary I've ever had up until about 2012 to show the kind of progress and you know the pitfalls and everything else and like <laughs> but the thing is like no one talks about that shit so like and it's yeah. kind of funny because like as soon as i brought, bring in the chart the whole crowd of two thousand people or something is just like <laughs> thing <from> this, <laughs> yeah, i'm like ah oh, fuck so much for this like not making yeah, be careful you're gonna make waves <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so hopefully you enjoyed the episode. I know we rambled on a lot, but it was a lot of fun to just kind of chat about a lot of the stuff. I was completely unprepared, not quite sure what we were going to talk about. But as I mentioned, if you have enjoyed the previous 100 episodes, it would mean the world to me if you can take a moment just to go to iTunes and leave a review or at least give this episode a rating. Give it one star if you hate it or give it five stars if you like it, whatever you feel is right. But it would definitely be something that I could show my gratitude for and I would love you forever if you could do that for me. Uh, At the same time, I'm hoping that there's another 100 episodes to go. So here's to that. In the meantime, if you want to leave a comment, you can go to alanmckay.com slash 100. So 100. And let me know what your favorite episode is. What were some of the insights that you got? What were some of the things that you've learned or enjoyed about the podcast? Uh, who are your favorite guests, whatever you want to share. I would love to hear about that and I'll definitely respond uh, as quick as I can. So that being said, next episode, I'm going to be interviewing Ben Snow from Industrial Light and Magic, one of their senior visual effects supervisors who has been around since 1994 at the studio and um, was, I think, the 30th employee there. I'm really excited about this episode. I got to admit, I was a little bit nervous speaking to, to Ben. I've met him a few times before. But um, still, you know, something I've never mentioned uh, was that he did have a huge impact on me, definitely inspired me a lot uh, when I was still, I think, like 18, 19 and obsessed with visual effects and the mummy had come out. And uh, there was a website at the time, vfxpro.com. And um, there's a lot of videos which were on the DVD uh, kind of talking about behind the scenes. And he was, you know, at the forefront of all of that. And uh, yeah, it was something that I always kind of obsessed a bit about, like, the visual effects in that movie and he was definitely a big part of that so um it was really great to kind of talk about a lot of these projects and just a lot of insights and amazing stuff that he's uh gotten to experience over his career so far so that being said i'll be back next episode check out the show notes alamckay.com slash 100 uh leave a comment review the podcast Take a moment to set some goals for the rest of the year that you can crush in the next two months because we're into october and I'll be back next week. Rock on.